Hi everyone, I'm back with another lecture looking at the immune system. And the immune system has two general divisions. It has the innate response and the adaptive responses. So this video is primarily going to focus on the innate response. So let's get started. Okay, so there are two general divisions to the immune system or the immune defense. Um, the first one is the innate response. The other one is the adaptive response. In this video, however, I'm talking about what's on this side, the innate response. So the innate responses are those responses that doesn't need to be tailor-made. So it's essentially, it's there. So when we look at the first line of defense, we're talking more of barriers. So we're talking about physical barriers like your skin. You know, your skin can protect you. You also have like cilia. You know, there are little hair-like structures that can trap debris and can take things out. Then we have chemical barriers. Some chemicals could be um, secreted from cells that can cause a response in the body. Then we have the genetic barriers like things um, that you can produce so will make pathogens less available to get into your cells. Um, just to mention an example of a chemical barrier that's really important is like lysozyme. Lysozyme is found in your tears and in your saliva, and it can actually stop certain bacteria, or certain types of pathogen from growing. It can actually kill it. All right, so now we'll take a look. Let me erase this and take a look at our second line of defense. All right, our second line of defense um, starts what we call immunology. The second and third line of defenses is where immunology comes in. But when we look at the second line defense, we're looking at processes like inflammation, like if you get an injury and you have things swelling. Then we have some proteins that we produce in our body that's very essential. We call them complement. Then we have interferon, which is a chemical um, or it's a produced by cells that can actually help kill off certain types of cells or prevent cells from getting infected with viruses, which I'll talk about later. And then we have the phagocytic cells or white blood cells, including like the macrophages and so forth. So the first line of defense includes the barriers. The second line includes these processes and proteins. And we'll talk more about that in the coming slides. All right, so this is just showing you example of innate. Um, this right here is looking at some defenses, some first line defense. So that includes like the skin is an example of a first line defense. We have hair, like the hairs in your nose um, and also mucus. Like if you were to get sick, you'd notice that you produce a lot more mucus. Um, and this is to help trap certain debris that's there. So that's an example of the first line of defense. So that's first line. Now, when we look at the second line defense, those are more cellular responses and processes. So like example, if you take a look here, we have mast cells that are under the skin that can help trigger an inflammatory response, which I'll talk about later. Then we have like complement, which are proteins circulating in the blood, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And those phagocytes, like the macrophages and the neutrophils. Um, I do want to mention here the natural killer cells or NK cells. Um, they're of a sim similar lineage as the lymphocytes, which I'll talk about in adaptive immunity, but they play a critical role at killing um, like cancer cells and very important. So this is showing you your first and second line of defenses. All right, this down here we'll talk about in another video. This is actually the adaptive immunity. That's the third line of defense, but we're not going to be talking about it in this video. Okay, so I'm just going to start off now with the second line defense. You remember the second line of defense starts with inflammation. So inflammation can happen if there's like an injury or break in the skin. For example, if you got a cut or major damage to, let's say, your shin bone, or even a pimple. They will elicit a response. So the first thing is, notice there's an injury here. Um, if microbes have entered into the site of, of the injury, you need white blood cells there present to detect that so battle can be fought. 
So here they're showing you mast cells that are under the skin. When it detects the injury and the, you know, the pathogen, it will then become activate, activated and it will send out chemical signals um, through histamines. And there's some other chemical signals, inflammatory signals that are sent out. Now, I want you to notice what happens. The histamines are starting to react on the vascular system, the blood vessels. And what it does, it kind of allows it, the junctions between it to open up. And after it opens up, you have the white blood cells, um, the phagocytes that can leave the system and actually go to the area where it's needed. So that recruitment, that process of white blood cells being recruited out of the bloodstream is actually called diapedesis. Diapedesis. Okay. All right. So also, in addition to the white blood cells coming out, I want you to notice that um, you see it looks like it's swelling a bit. The reason why it's swelling here is because we do have fluids that are actually leaving the, ven the vascular system to actually go to the site where the battle is. White blood cells fight better when there is um, fluids around. So that um, fluids that's brought to the site is what causes that swelling and that edema and that give it that redness appearance around the site of inflammation. And sometimes that inflammatory response can press on nerve endings, free nerve endings that can cause pain. So if you ever had inflammation, like you have a cut and it starts to swell or a mosquito bite or anything like that, um, this is the process that's happening. Now you will eventually have um, resolution or healing of that site, but I just wanted to show you the first two responses of inflammation. So that's the first part that we're talking about regarding um, the second line defense. Okay, so here is complement. This looks complicated, but I'm just going to give you the essential. We have three um, types of complement systems, so three of them. We have our lectin, we have our classical, or classic, classical, and we have our alternative. Alternative, okay? All three are actually activated through different mechanisms, but it doesn't matter which pathway triggered the activation. They will all end up coming through C3. So what in the world are all these proteins? Well, your liver produces proteins called complement proteins. There are a lot of them, and you see a lot of them have numbers like C2, C4, C3. We see these numbers, C5. Um, they're usually inactive in your blood. But when they come across a foreign invader like a bacteria or whatever the trigger is, it will become activated, so it may become cleaved and activated. So I'm just going to talk about what happens down here at C3 because that's, like I said, where all the complement cascades occur. All right, so C3 is here, and when it bumps into something foreign or when it gets its trigger, there's an enzyme called C3 convertase that will split the C3 into a C3A and a C3B, okay? Now, C3A goes to actually recruit other inflammatory cells or other white blood cells to the site. But C3B um, actually works along with C5. C5 is like the Hulk, right? So it's quite strong. It's powerful because once it's activated and split, it starts to bind with other complement proteins like C6. And here this is look this is showing you a foreign invader. I want you to see when C5 when, when the component C5 alpha actually becomes cleaved, it joins with the other complement proteins starting a cascade. So it recruits C6, C7, C8 until it kind of forms a pore in the membrane of the offending organism. So this cascade of protein is called the membrane attack complex, which we see here. All right, so the membrane attack complex. Now, we abbreviate that as MAC, okay? And when that happens, 
um, something pretty bad is going to happen to the foreign invader. So here is showing you the complement proteins that formed a channel in the membrane. I want you to notice that the membrane is no longer semi-permeable. So you're going to have all kind of fluids rushing into the cell and will cause that foreign cell to explode. So complement is a very powerful enhancer of the innate immune system, the second line of defense, because you have those proteins that will come in, they're complement proteins, they're typically inactive, but when they become active, they will converge as C3, and from there they can form that MAC system or membrane attack complex that we see here. So it's very important to have complement active. Okay, so let's talk about some chemical signals like interferons. All right, interferons are produced by cells that are virally infected. All right, so there are different types of interferons based on the cell type that's producing it. Like example, we have interferon gamma, but I'm not going to go into that detail in this video. But here you have interferons or chemicals that are secreted from the virally infected cells. And what they will do is three things. First, they will go to a neighboring cell and actually um, send a signal to that cell that there is a virus present and we need to make sure that you are producing antiviral proteins. So if the virus ever gets into that cell, the troops are already there ready to fight. The other thing interferons do is actually um, send signals to cells that are virally affected to undergo cell death. That process is called apoptosis. Another thing that interferons can do is activate other immune cells. All right, so interferons are really, really important, especially when it comes to virally infected cells because they have to send that message out. They're like troops, okay? So they will send message out that there is an invader and you better be prepared or if you're invaded, you're going to get killed, okay? Okay, so now let's talk about this, the cellular responses of the second line of defense. So these are the white blood cells. We have our granular sites, and the granular sites include the eosinophils, the basophils, and the neutrophils. And then we have our agranular site, which is the monocyte. Now, the lymphocytes that are here, we won't talk about those until the adaptive immunity, which is the third line of defense. But for this one, I do want to talk about this. I'm going to star the neutrophil. The neutrophil is the most abundant that's found in the body, the most abundant phagocytic cell. And I'll talk about phagocytosis in a minute. So if you have high levels of neutrophil circulating in your body, that's a, almost a great indicator that you have some kind of bacterial infection. All right, the next one I do want to talk about is the eosinophils. The eosinophils will actually go up in higher levels if you have a eukaryotic infection, so like an infection with a fungus or an infection with a parasite. But typically they're not found in high amounts unless you have an infection with one of those two. Now the basophils kind of play a role in al allergy or allergic type responses because they, um, so if someone has like a anaphylactic response or really bad allergies, they will have higher levels of basophils in their system. Now the monocyte, um, when it becomes ac active, we call it a macrophage. And the macrophages are actually very, very important. It actually goes and um, engulfs uh, foreign particles that's there, and it also acts as an antigen-presenting cell, which I will talk about in a second. Dendritic cells are another cell type that's not on here that's also um, antigen-presenting, so we call them dendritic cells, okay? And they're actually kind of like the brains of the, c the cellular response of the second line of defense. Now, when we are talking about 
um, these phagocytes, like the neutrophils and the macrophage. So they have a particular response that they do. So bacteria usually have um, proteins on their surface or structures on the surface that receptors on the white blood cells can recognize. These receptors, once they come in contact, will trigger an event that they can take in that foreign invader. So it forms a vesicle called a phagosome around it. Now the phagosome will bind to lysosomes that are in the cell. So lysosomes have digestive enzymes on the inside. So once they join, the phagosome plus the lysosome makes the phagolysosome. And notice the particles in here are getting digested because of the lysosomes. And we can have um, those proteins be secreted out and they can actually um, be used by the B cells later on in the adaptive immunity. So this right here is the process of phagocytosis and um, it's used by phagocytes like macrophages and neutrophils. All right, so another major thing that I want to talk about is the major histocompatibility complexes. Okay, so these are um, receptors, complex receptors found on the surface. We have two types. We have MHC1, and then we have MHC2. So these are showing you the structures of both one and two. Now the jobs of this, these are found on all your cells' surfaces. You know, different cells have different MHC types displayed. Now they all display antigens, okay? So they're almost like ID cards and anything that's on the inside of the cell, it will display on the surface. And we see these um, very important in the antigen presenting cells, like the macrophages and the neutrophils, because they will go ahead and um, display antigens on the surface. So if this is a virally infected cell, it can display virus proteins on the surface. Right? If this is a cell that is a cancer cell, just give an example, it will display cancer proteins on the surface. So they will go ahead and display proteins like viral proteins or cancer proteins on the cell and then other cell types can come along like the natural killer cell or a T cell, which I'll talk about later on, will see this as something that's not right and can actually destroy the cell that's showing the foreign invader on the IDs. So the MHCs are very important because they help to display self proteins and if the cell is infected with something, it will be told on by being displayed on the MHC complex. So let's talk a little bit about how the major histocompatibility complex and anti antigen presentation works. So if you look here, this could be, let's say, a macrophage. They will have the major histocompatibility complex 2 on its surface. Here is showing you a T cell that's not active. All right, so if the T cell comes along and actually IDs what's, what it's displaying, if this is something that's not correct, something that needs to be destroyed, the antigen presenting cell will send out chemical signals to activate that T cell or that cell. All right, so we'll talk more about um, this activation process when we get to the adaptive immunity. So antigen presentation is very important. The process, the process that actually undergoes here is called co-stimulation, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. We see that occurring for both the two divisions of the T cells, which I'll talk about in the next video. This is the helper T cell. That is the cytotoxic T cell. They use the same type of principle. Okay, so it's quiz time. Let's see what you remembered. How many lines of defense or defenses is are found in the innate system? Hopefully you said two lines of defense, the first and second lines. So those are what we see in the innate. Remember, third line of defense is adaptive. What does the first line of defense include? So remember, the first line of defense um, 
has a particular type of characteristics. And the characteristics that I'm looking for is that the first line of defense are more of the barriers, the protective outer layers or protective layers. So that includes the physical barriers like skin, chemical barriers like lysozyme and the tears, and genetic barriers like things that some people may genetically express that allows them to be resistant to certain types of pathogens. What does second line of defense include? Okay, so we already said first, the second line defense inflammation, um, includes inflammation, complement, phagocytosis, and interferons. All right, so those were the different things we spoke about. In case of inflammation due to injury, what causes swelling? So during injury, what causes swelling? All right, so what happens is immune cells are actually at the site. Remember, they're mast cells, and they will produce chemical signals called histamines. I don't know if you remember the diagram, but the histamines actually work on the blood vessels, the vascularization, and it allows the vessels to kind of become leaky. So it kind of opens up the junction a bit. That allows white blood cells to leave the vascular system and go to the site of injury. In addition, water or fluids are also being leaked out of the venous or the vascular system, and that's what causes swelling or edema. But just to make note, if you have white blood cells being recruited to that site, the white blood cell is going to elicit more of an inflammatory response, so kind of magnifying the process. What cells are antigen-presenting cells? Well, first of all, antigen-presenting cells includes like the dendritic cells and the macrophage. But there are white blood cells that presents antigens to lymphocytes, like the T cells. And they're important in activating of the T cells, as well as they display antigens on the MHCs. So the MHCs, remember, are the ID cards that will display whatever proteins on the inside and the T cells will recognize it and become activated by the antigen present presenting cells and then the battle can be fought. How many complement pathways are there? Hopefully you said three, right? We have the alternate, the classical, and the lectin. It doesn't matter how, um, how they're activated, but they converge at C, Three. And then after that point, they can form what's called the membrane attack complex. So what is the membrane attack complex? Let's talk about that. During a membrane attack complex formation, that C3 protein gets cleaved and it recruits C5. C5 also becomes cleaved and one of the fragments of C5 joins with C6 and it starts that complement cascade. So if this is the membrane, here you have C6, then C7, then C8, C9, and so forth. And they will kind of like form a hole that will allow things to rush into the cell. That's the membrane attack complex causing the cells to lyse. Please describe the process of phagocytosis. Hopefully you remember this. Phagocytic white blood cells, like the macrophages, have receptors for pathogen structures, okay? Once in contact, the foreign particle, or with the microbe, gets brought in, forming a phagosome. The lysosome fu fuses to the phagosome, forming a phagolysosome. So here, showing you white blood cell. Here's, um, you know, the foreign invader that's attached to the receptor. It then is brought in to form that phagosome. Okay, that's the phagosome. I'll put a P there. Then here's the lysosome coming and it will attach. When it attaches, we have what's known as the phagolysosome. Okay, so digestion occurs in here and then it will release the debris outside. So that's the process of phagocytosis. Which granulocyte is the most abundant in the body? Hopefully, you said. Out of this group, hopefully you say neutrophils. Okay, that's the most abundant granulocyte in the body. Now, these two are granular sites, okay, but they're not the most abundant. This is not even a granular site at all. 
So hopefully you got 100 on this quiz. Um, please let me know how you did. This is just covering the basic innate um, responses that includes the barriers and also that inflammatory responses, the complement, the phagocytosis, and the interferon chemicals, okay? So just leave a comment. Let me know what you learned or let me know how you did on the quiz. Thank you. Until next time, bye.